Okay, guys. Um, for anyone who may not know him, this is Doug Thompson. Uh, he's a professor at Mercer, uh, and among other things, teaches racial history, and you also teach great books, right? Um, and uh, Doug and I were talking back and forth on Facebook one night, and I uh, he mentioned teaching racial history, and I said, I was telling him about this play, and that I wanted to do an audience talk back, and asked him if he would be involved. He was very kind to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug and to our cast, and this is an opportunity for you to talk to our cast, ask our cast uh, anything you'd like to uh, hear from them, uh, and also uh, from Doug, too. Um, I'll uh, give a quick explanation for why this uh, topic uh, matters to me. So I was doing a graduate program in the University of Virginia, and my dissertation looks at Richmond, Virginia, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and I became fascinated by uh, a community there, it's called Barton Heights. So it's not Claiborne Park, but uh, Barton Heights. Uh, and uh, in the first part of 1950, 1951, uh, there are four white churches, five white churches, excuse me, in a four block radius of each other, uh, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, and Episcopalian. Right? So got them all covered. Not five. And, and in, 19, in 1960, only one of them was there. And so I became fascinated How by fast did that happen? In, in the ten year period. Uh, and I became fascinated by how the neighborhood transitions. Uh, and so I actually followed churches. Uh, the, it's a book project that will come later. Um, but I, I was actually fascinated by something that occurs in the play, kind of in both directions, um, which is that in uh, 1952, the Baptist congregation is having a conversation about moving or selling out their parsonage, the place where the pastor lives, uh, because black families had moved in. Uh, and what happened was the church had a conversation about property values. Uh, and the presumption about this moving process is that property values always go down based on this racial, they call it racial incursion. Uh, in fact, all property values go up. They always go up. Uh, because when uh, a group moves in, they're often moving out of a place they've been forced into. And they are often doctors, lawyers, um, uh, teachers, ministers. So they actually bring money with them into the neighborhood. But the, the perception is that property values <coughs> go down. Uh, Barton Heights goes to a similar, Clover Park has a similar uh, trajectory, that, or the story has a similar trajectory, that there's a fall off. Uh, the community, in fact, is coming back uh, through a process known as gentrification, which is exactly what the play is picking up uh, on the backside, the, the second act. Um, and the community has to have a very interesting question about what happens, what changes that neighborhood uh, when the, the new folks <laughs> incur, right, come in. Uh, and so uh, I'm struck by the play in part because it picks up very, I think, very powerfully the middle section, intermission is a raisin in the sun, right? That's what's going on in the middle. Uh, and so you've already experienced that. What you're picking up is what happened before and after uh, that effect or that, that particular production. Uh, and so one of the things that's fascinating to me, uh, and I'll start here and then I'll let them do all the talking because it's really theirs to, uh, to do. Um, but Carl, who gets to be the... Uh, openly racist <laughs> character in the first act, uh, becomes Kevin, uh, who has this interesting line oh, about, Steve. I'm sorry, Steve, right, about this interesting line about wanting to leave the community he's in, and in fact come into a community that is, doesn't look like him, mm -hmm. right? Except that the entire act is wrapped around the, the joke, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so what is it like to play a character who is both openly racist and recognizes that the racism is the problem, but then participates in it? So, that, so it's a sort of an open question. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think it, um, looking at it as a performance thing, it, it would kind of, at first I thought they were really, really different, but then there was a lot of similarities. To me, looking at it as an actor, it, 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 like, because I think they uh, both really believed in what how they felt about their very very strong opinionated, especially Carl. Yeah, just, yeah. 
change. But, um, you know, I just look at it as, a, you know, as an actor, you put it in there and say, okay, he believes what he believes. And that, that would be just about what it is to Steve. Um, I don't know. I mean, he said, I think one of the defining things he said, the one black guy he, he knew, he didn't even say it was his friend, but it's the one black guy he knew in his entire school. So I think he was just wanting to change his, uh, his location or something, or be, become a little bit more diverse. And he was only the kind of bravest one he even talked about. Uh, the, the whole conversation was being shot all around. He was the only one to kind of actually be brave enough to talk about it, which is great. <laughs> well, and, and Lindsay, Lindsay's an interesting character too because she's the she's she's what happened, right? The reason Carl can be the the way he is in 1959 is it's culturally acceptable uh, in, in that particular uh, area or, or his group, right? It's culturally acceptable. Lindsay is an example of a character whose racism is actually subterranean. She's not allowed to be openly racist. Uh, and it, and it's Steve who calls her on it when she says, my, "Half of my friends are black," mm -hmm. which is a which is a trope for white folks when they want to get away from racism. Uh, my one black friend. <laughs> uh, right. So anyway, I, I wondered what it was like to be that that kind of. Well, honestly, with um, and you know, it's, with Lindsay, I guess the what I thought about was. She is racist to a certain degree, but I think her main goal in this act is she just, she's very selfish. She's really concerned about her house. She doesn't care. It's when her husband seems to bring out the elephant in the room because she's like, no, no, we're not gonna get anywhere if we bring that up. Let's just all be nice and do our pretend game and then I'll get my house. So she is, she's got her preconceived notions and her stereotypes in her head, but at this point she's like, She's just such a very selfish person. She's like, I want everybody to just be nice, let's play nice, and come to an agreement at the end of the day that I can build my house. And so I think that's the that's the outlook I took when I was playing Lindsay was that she is very much so just totally focused on this one thing, and that's why she is so angry, I feel like, with her husband, is that he's killing her. Yeah, she gets caught on it, too. Yeah. I don't know if y'all caught it, but it's when she's like, oh, I'm changing for the better. And all right, that. right. Like, ah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so she's really like, she's really normal. But, <laughs> <laughs> she's sorry, that's the way we are. But she wants what she wants, wants and she'll what she needs to to get it. Yeah. Well, that does sound for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. Well, and I think I think it's interesting because we're we're at, what makes the play fascinating for me is that we're we're we have, we recognize racism exists. We're uncomfortable with what it is, right? And so, or I think we are anyway. And so, what we tend to do, what I do is I do this with students often. What we tend to do is we talk about racism as if it's the mean thing, right? It's it's people who hate one another. Well, I can't be racist if I don't hate anyone. Well, actually, you can because we're racialized. We the think in racial terms, terms. It just is. right? And 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 uh, and it's uh, it's that kind of wave that's going throughout the play that I think is pulling pulling out these teasing out these pieces. Mm -hmm. The the character I love most. This is me. The character I love most is Francine. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was struck by the script thing. Beyond racism, it, it has, the play speaks to how we all feel about some people different in lots of different ways. The, the mentally deficient person at the grocery store, and they didn't, they didn't quite do it to uh, Betsy, Betsy yeah. but they almost did. They marginalized her right there, you know, because you know, they were all going so fast and everything. There were, there were, and there were, there was something else. Homosexuality, they addressed. The discrimination against homosexuality, they Oh, yeah, out. oh, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about that because that, it's about, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Kind of it. It's, it's not our, our um, trouble with diversity, with mm -hmm. differences. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, that's what the play is. I'll make an observation and open it up. The, Francine's character uh, is interesting to me because at the very end of the scene, or the very end of the act, mm. she talks about letting them beat their heads out. 
Yeah. Yeah. I only have two more days left. Yeah. <laughs> they're, all, they're all idiots. Right? There's this. There's this. It's a. It's a. It's. You get a sense that the family has trouble, right, because of Kenneth's death. But they have more trouble than that, and it's Bev's relationship to Francine that everything is okay. Well, the, the phone rings if we make you answer the phone, right? They, yeah. and, and there's this sense of, I, right, I have, I have to go to work, and I'm really ready for these people to go away, right? And it actually opened, if, with, if you can hold on to Raisin in the Sun, it opens up mm -hmm. why that matters in that moment at the intercession, who's coming into the house, right, the, 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 the domestic. Uh, that, that for me is why, that line's very important, but it sometimes gets missed, I think, uh, in the chaos that's going on. Sorry, you had a question, and I'll step out. And the truth in lending is supposed to disclose. Well, I'm um, previously a nursing professor, associate professor in psychiatry. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a real psychiatrist. But what's fascinating to me, and I think I speak to some people ahead of time about this, what's fascinating to me, I didn't grow up in the States. I didn't grow up as a black American or so. I grew up in Jamaica and we had a long day in it. And it was um, class into writers, people. So we always categorize people do this everywhere at my point. But I get to the States and I hear this, it's almost an obsession at this point. Because the 1950s were different from now. And um, I got here in 63, mm -hmm. University of State New York. And that's when I became aware that somehow I was supposed to be in fear. <laughs> I remember saying to somebody, said, oh, I didn't fear that someone is smarter than all of these people. I knew I wasn't being cocky I was just bewildered by it. But if we come forward to today, because I hear this stuff over and over, and this race thing is played up, and, this race, and you know what I've decided as a psychiatrist? I've worked with people intensely, and I've said to them, you come in here and you talk about your problems. People looking at you as you're driving up to get to my house, your hair is well done. I said, they are thinking you have no problems, right? Everybody's getting something, is my point. Nobody in this room has a bigger <laughs> uh, chunk of a monkey around us. The fact is, we need all to take it off of us. And I notice when we have assemblies like this and we're talking about race, white people never say anything. And if they say anything, they have to agree that there was oppression and we have to beat ourselves, you know, and you know, and they, they have to curtsy to me because I'm black to you know, and, 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 and. and so it goes on and on. And my liberating thing, and I've spoken to many black men students, black girls, I said, first of all, bless the Lord that you are in the school. And there is affirmative action, thank God for it, and stop saying the computers are evil and racist. The computer doesn't know your race. So if you're failing in the course, you need to be too much energy into thinking that. And it turns everything around them. Is that what I'm Because we are blessed in this country. And there is a history of stuff, nobody's contesting that. But the people who succeed, if you look at Ben Carson again, it's a perfect point. People who succeed, succeed the same way. If I'm growing great tomatoes and you're living next to me, is it better that somebody comes along and says, you should have my, some of my tomatoes, or that you should learn how to grow good tomatoes from me. You see what I'm saying? And that goes both ways, black and white. Because blacks have talents, whites have talents, Asians have talents, Jewish people have talents. Because there are certain things that were emphasized in certain cultures, and that becomes a strength. And so that's what makes the U.S. successful. I have a question. That, would you say that is limited then to a racial divide, these ideas that we're so focused on ourselves, or would that would you extend that thought to the feminism movement per se, or even um, I don't know, I can't think of anything right now actually besides the feminism movement, but but do you see what I'm saying? Like, is it that we're so focused on ourselves that we forget to see the big picture? It's almost like in high school, everybody says, oh. Don't worry about looking at everybody looking at you because they're all doing the same thing of looking thinking, oh, everybody's staring at me. So if we all, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken, then please correct me, because I found value, of course, in what you said, but is it that we're so focused on ourselves that we're missing the bigger picture, basically, 
Like we're so worried about everybody else looking at us that we don't make it a point to say, hey, I need to think of someone else. You're brilliant. You know, <laughs> I, have, I have nothing to do with IQ. It's inside work. Because you've nailed it. We have become a very narcissistic society. Mm -hmm. And we play one against the other, and people are invested in playing us off on each other, mm -hmm. right? Because it gets them something. So every time you think somebody's giving you something for nothing, examine them very carefully. Mm -hmm. No, just it's it's not really really it for nothing. Mm -hmm. Somebody's favorite. So you've nailed it. So we have turned women against men, blacks against whites, whites against. You know, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you have nailed it. We have lost the spirit that we are all human. In from the play, mm -hmm. you know what they got from the play? Your personality is different. And even in the second half, the same overbearing, right? That came out. You, the this personality is the same. It goes to black or white. Is that the actual personality? It's diet, it's diet. And you didn't tell me because when we have black play, and you throw some black words in there. That's what I did. Right? I, do, I do think there's one, I think the one character that you get a glimpse of it is Francine. At the, but Lena's character in Francine are different. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and I, I, I said to Jim, I'm struck by the playwright's use of a, uh, a, an opinionated black woman, mm -hmm. right? Because that is, uh, that's also a trope. That, that's a stereotype. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is. And it played, but, it, it, but you have to have it, right? I mean, at some level in this, mm -hmm. in this construct, you have to have it. I'm sort of curious, uh, when, you, when you're going through the scene with Steve, do you actually see it as race? I, I know. I'm trying to ask you to be in your character, but is the is it about race, or is it about income changing the neighborhood? I think she, in her mind, and my character's mind, I don't think to her it's about race. Really, it's about the house. She said when he said you, she brought up all these issues, and I say about your house, right. and then the original issue was the inappropriately sized house. Your playing mm -hmm. field, and then there was a, a line about 15 feet three inches, and we were like, I was like, from 15 feet three inches. So the issue really was changing the look of the neighborhood, and she remembers it one way. But she she's very um, also knowledgeable about the things that are going on in the world and what right. else is going on, and she just mentions those things, mm -hmm. and so that might be interpreted differently. But she's just being factual. <laughs> and some characters are like to her are like pretending like they don't know, like her husband. Don't act like you don't know. Right. Don't be purposely <laughs> not evil. Please, are you serious? Don't be purposely not evil. These are facts. Those things are true. They happen. And everybody else was like, no, you can't prove that. No, I'm like, yes, it is. Oh, before decades, are you serious? But it was really right. I, but I think that's the catch, right? Mm -hmm. It's the four decade line, mm -hmm. which which actually makes it about race. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, and and that's what I mean by it's it's this it's the subterranean is the way that I think right. of it and help students to think about it. Right. If it's overtly racist, we all get turned off. Mm -hmm. Right. We all go up. Oh, we see yeah. it. That's racism. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. What we what we are less inclined to see is the way that we are racially constructed. Right, and so one of the things that the play points out is that Kaiwan Park actually had been a German community. Mm -hmm. yeah. She drops that from its history. Yes. Right. She says yes. this has been a black community. Yeah, I don't right? See a See, right, right. See how it gets. So mm -hmm. the construction actually is in race, whether we whether we want it to be in race or not. It's it's constructed right. that it's, way. It's being disrespectful of traditions yep. and history. Yeah, and and what we you know we're dealing with for an individual maybe the other when what we should be doing is embracing the differences and we don't do that and and that's a shame yeah. because because everybody has everybody has a rich tradition family traditions mm -hmm. and cultural traditions and and we are dismissive of it. Well, what, and I would, I would say that what we tend to do is we tend to embrace our own and dismiss the other, right? So, so the, the line there is, uh, in, in fact, it's um, Kathy's character, right? Ka Kathy's from that neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? That, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's forced into the scene when, when she's, she's, um, she's Betsy. Betsy's daughter, right? She's Betsy's daughter. Betsy and Paul. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But when my parents, her parents moved, moved. That's they right. got, yeah. They moved. Yeah. And they will move, they will do the exact same thing. They left. They left. Carl, Carl has acknowledged that this, this community is changing, so he's getting out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sort of. But this idea about the way in which we construct, uh, we're constructed inside racial comp uh, uh, compartments in ways that we may not want to. May, it's, it's being told, I'm black. Well, no, I'm not, because I'm not from here. I don't think in those terms. Well, it doesn't matter, because that's kind of how you're getting, you're getting understood, um, right? And so I, I do this with, um, with students. Uh, Tiger Woods doesn't want to be called black, and so he, he's the one who's given us sort of the multi. He may you got that term, right? right? You got to have a whole bunch of categories for him. And I tell him, but if he's driving through Forsyth County, Georgia, he's a black man, <laughs> right? He, he he can only be a black man because he's the the construction is placed on him regardless of what he wants. And so when you talk about what we got to learn how to embrace sort of the diversity, the problem is. I want to keep my own history, right? My own family's history, but yours needs to figure out how to accept mine. And by the way, all racial groups do this to each other. It doesn't matter which group you're in, uh, which in some ways is, is interesting because the play gets at this, but I, 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 so this is for the cast and the audience. Um, the way in which racialization affects all of us, both positively and negatively, right? And so when Lena praises the neighborhood's history, mm -hmm. right, that's a racial construction. Mm -hmm. It's because black people did this, mm -hmm. right? That, that's, well, okay. Because she doesn't see back to when it was white people and Murray Gelman moved in. Right, that's right. And she, uh, there's only a certain part of the history that matters to her. Right, right. that's exactly, exactly right. Exactly. And, so the, and so the problem is, how do you construct, how do you, how do you accept other people's differences, but also value your own, right? It, those things are intention. And for most of us, we're not allowed to do that, right? It's just not, it's, it's just told. You either have to sort of give up your racial assumptions, uh, or if you don't give them up, then you must have somehow be racist, right? And, and that's a tricky place to be, that you, you uh, I, do this, I do this often with students. Um, uh, you fall in love with the person that you are convinced you will spend the rest of your life with. Right? Yeah. And you gotta take them home to grandma. And their pigmentation doesn't look anything like yours. And the students in the class will all start shaking their heads like this. And it doesn't matter what their skin pigmentation is. Everybody is thinking in these terms. I, I can only bring home certain people, looking people, right? And so my, I, my grandmother, I had a boyfriend whose mother was Cuban and Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my grandmother was horrified, huh. and it made no sense to me at, at that time. And as I've gotten older, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I was hot for this Cuban. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, and at that time, I just dismissed her entirely because of my grandmother, she'd just be in. But you're exactly right. Everybody, everybody does that. I mean, his grandmother probably thought, why are you bringing a white girl who's a Baptist? So. <laughs> my grandmother, uh, she was living with us in the household, and uh, my cousin came by with uh, with his uh, like girlfriend, and she was all pleasant and all. As soon as they left, oh, but she was like, "I'm disowning them." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, why?" And she goes, "Well, for him to be bringing home a white woman, and you just don't know how much that uh, we had to suffer back then. You don't know what we went through." But, and meanwhile, I'm thinking, "Well, I don't want to tell her that I am spitting on red." <laughs> I, I, I agree, except that I think I think that it, 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 it it's the response there. I'm gonna keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Right. And so what happens? That's a that long ago. I'm a lot older than right. that. Right. This, 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 this would be fairly recent. Mm -hmm. And and the sense of I really can't talk about it. Right. I can't. And and part of why I do that in classes is 
my, my concern is that when we, when we say we're going to talk about race or racism, we're just afraid everybody's going to start yelling at each other. I often have to tell students, somebody might need to yell. It's not directed at you. You should just let them yell. It's okay. However, uh, in order to be honest about it, you have to recognize how we have all been racially constructed. Uh, and, and in fact, what you got to get out, and, and what's interesting is white students are often al almost amazed at that response. Right? Wait a minute. Black students have to go through this? Right? Or, in the American context, this is brutal, that uh, African American communities have racial hierarchies within them. That, that, that you know, the light skinned versus dark skinned, and white students Again, it's, it's stuff they don't think about, they don't hear, they don't recognize. And so when we say we're going to talk about race, it's this uncomfortable moment that we either don't talk about it. or So I, I agree with you. I do think it's in the past. Uh, but there was a study done uh, about a, a year ago uh, that shows that the millennial generation is not as uh, racially open as we think they are. So the presumption is we're going to be progressively moving in a, in a direction where we don't see skin pigmentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's these grandparents and parents and communities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we're, we're instilled, the, the, whether we want to be or not, we are instilled with these same traditions. We still have these uh, these stereotypes that are brought down from generation to generation. Preconceived notions. Yeah, absolutely. So even though, you know, even though I, I want to be more progressive and uh, you know love everybody and all that stuff. There's still some of those different things, you know, uh, that where you will find yourself repeating something that your grandmother or your mother or your father was uh, told to you when you were a little kid, and you still somewhat believe that. And you're questioning now, why did I just say that? When that's not really what, how I feel about it. And, yeah, I mean, I have in my neighborhood. In my neighborhood, is very racially diverse, but there are some. It's a Caucasian family across the street, and this little white boy um, says things sometimes, you know, and you're like, what? what? I mean, I know where he got it from, but he's like a little, the little boy. Yeah. And he's saying they were playing cops and robbers one day, and um, the family that told me was, is Jewish, and they were. He had a gun, just a play gun. He said, "I'm gonna get you." Now. He was playing with black kids. He said, "I'm gonna get you now." And Martin Luther is not here to save you. Oh, oh, oh. oh. And he's a little boy. And another time he said, these are civil rights dogs we got. And they don't like black people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, wow. And, and it also I'm gets, just saying. It also gets, that, that, those examples <laughs> get it as diversity doesn't occur because you live in proximity to each other. Right? That, that's, that's part of what the fear yes. is in the play. Because if somebody moves in. Together. Right. Right. Have right. dinner. You know. Mm -hmm. The barbecues. <laughs> and you know, and my question is this. And I, I worry about this. I think, too, sometimes we get so, I have, I have like my, my mother's side of Italian, my side is Irish, my mom's side had great struggles getting to America. Mm -hmm. I am proud of my heritage. I am proud of what my pigmentation represents, just as I expect other people to be. Like my friend, she looks, for all intents and purposes, she looks black, she's my best friend in life, and she one time was, she gets very frustrated. She's like, no, I'm, I'm half Filipino and half Hispanic. She was just like, and I feel like everybody has to attach this. She's like, my identity is not attached to my pigmentation, but I do have a history because of it. And I want people to know that. And I feel like sometimes then our efforts to be accepting and, and you know, always looking at others, that we forget that you're allowed to be prideful for who you are. That is allowed. What you're not allowed to do is to forget that other people are allowed to be prideful for what they are. And I feel like this play did an excellent job of showing that in the first and second. Lena's very proud. It's she mm -hmm. just she is. It's her home. It's her heritage. It's her history. Mm -hmm. You know, Lindsay's there. I have I have a baby on the way. I'm building this huge house because we've made it. You know, and I mean, you know, Tom steps up and says, "I'm gay." You know, like everybody has their they're proud of it's pieces of us that identify with us. And sometimes I think that's why I like this place so much is that it it's that we're so not wanting to talk about it and yet we're always wanting to talk about it. Because it's who we are. I mean for lack of better words. The thing is who we are. 
because it's not all of them. Yeah. Agreed. Because you know, you said you might apologize and you are not getting the whole picture here. I came from the north and stood south. Mm -hmm. You be amazed. And I'm going to tell you right over here. You know who the racist is? Not racist. The stereotyping people are black people. It's different. I've lived in the no, north. I'm saying what the black people how they come across. Right. Because of slavery, black people are holding on to more stuff than what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. in general. Right? Yeah. And the previous thing that I saw was South Blue. Yeah. My son is at Blue. He has a black bench at Blue. Now, would you think that the black kids who get admitted to do would be a little bit more sophisticated? They had a black edge. If a black fellow went and sat on one of the Caucasian fraternity benches, the other to come over and pull him over. You cannot sit on the head. And this is a sophisticated place. Right, but, and, and that's what I mean by racial construction in a way that you might want to break free of the constructions that are that you're not allowed. And, and the, the what part of the play actually gets at some other pieces of this. Um, uh, Gelman's not white, right? So within American history, if you were Jewish or Italian or Irish, mm -hmm. you were actually not white. You you were you were given an ethnic identity. Um, the the problem or the the thing for things like particularly Irish. In fact, they are they are put in ghettos. Irish, when they come in in the 19th century, are placed in ghettos in, in places uh, in a um, uh, place like New York, uh, and so where uh, black families live, that's where Irish are required to live. Right. In fact, the N word consistently throughout the 19th century is used on Irish. Um, it, it's interchangeable, Irish or, or black. Um, but the difference between the two is that the Irish can fight to be white. And so what happens is that they can then start claiming whiteness by pigmentation. Blacks cannot. They can never overcome the pigmentation issue. And so they can't actually escape the construction that's been placed on them. And so the, these things, that they have long histories, right? So when the Gelman uh, line pops up, it's the Jewishness. He can't be white. But we got over that, right? That's progress. That's, that's presumed to be progress. Um, uh, but there's something hidden in that, which is that uh, they don't hire uh, Kenneth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that that situates Russ's response to the entire uh -huh. community. Right? I'm supposed to be worried about everybody else, but nobody worried about my son. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, then uses a stereotype, Gelman. Higher wheeler, right? Yeah. Instead of my son, yeah. right? That, that, that he he was no better. Which is, says, which is the hardest word for me to actually say in this show. Yeah. It's such a hard, right? Yeah. In in a manner that, that right that's yeah. intended in that right in that scene. Let me ask a question of everybody here. Yeah, when you're sitting in a room, and it's an open question. When you're sitting in a room, and there are people of different shades of color. Are you impressed with the intelligence of the person? Once people start talking and stuff, are you still home upon what color they are? Or do you start listening? For example, I think it's an institutional problem. It's not just face to face. Mm -hmm. I see it as an institutional problem too. That it's the way society views things. And then we each as individuals act them out, but it's society who are set up to buy into that. Who, who makes up society? Even at, I mean, so my time, time, over time. Yeah. I personally um, don't care what person's skin who is. That's, that's just me. I, I could talk. Me and this lady right here yeah. talk all the time. I can no, just have yeah. the greatest time talking. I mean, I, I don't care. I can't speak for everybody else. I, I do believe that other people, like other cast members are the same way. They don't care about color. But other thing that attracts me to people is similarity in experiences. And sometimes that comes with we both look alike. Because sometimes experiences yeah. are the same based on your yeah. but, but it's not that I'm looking for that, but it just sometimes <laughs> happens because we have, we have a common ground. We have similar background. And you can talk about more things because you have more things in common. And we assume we assume that based on on you know, visual cues first. Yeah. I mean that 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 that's students do this often when they go into a room and they go to sit down. 
they will they will self segregate <laughs> in, yeah, inside the room. And, over and, 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 what, and what they're doing is they're walking over. Yeah, Mercer has this issue with the undergraduate cafeteria, <laughs> and, and so you you, 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 uh, you get your food, and all of a sudden you sit down. Well, this one group sits like this, and one group sits like this, and one group sits like this. And the and, but the, what you're doing is you're cueing off of visual cues first, mm -hmm. and so pigmentation is what mm -hmm. hits you first. What you often students will talk about this when I do the history of race class. They'll talk about it that that they that they sat next to someone because it, they, the person looked like them. Mm -hmm. and they realized they didn't have anything in common. Exactly. That they really had something in common with somebody two rows back. Right. That didn't look anything like them, but they'd actually had the exact same experience growing up. Mm -hmm. But the first thing will be the color, and and, it, and that's what when I talk about being racialized, that's how we are. We're trained to see it. Um, uh, I do this with students. Uh, uh, when did you discover that your parents taught you how to drive around certain areas of town? They actually have now coded you in a racial way. <clears throat> because you discovered that from point A to point B, this would be the fastest way, but you didn't go that way. You, you, you were taught to go around. Well, what, why were you taught to go around? Well, because you were going to end up in neighborhoods that they were uncomfortable with. But that's not a judgment about how your parents raised you. It's a, it's a, it's a judgment about the way in which we racialize almost all of our activities. But I mean, some neighborhood black school guys, right. and they're never going to the. I, I mean, no, that's right. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No, I, 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 I know in East Tennessee, there are certain hollers you do not drive right. into. It has nothing to do with race. Right. And well, act or it does, and and it involves the other word that we use freely, but we don't. It's the N word. Mm -hmm. It's R. It's rednecks. Rednecks is a pejorative term. Right, right. right. It's, it's a cultural thing, it's, but not right. necessarily racist. Right. Well, no, it, it, it is. It's racially constructed. Redneck is designed to delineate a lower class of white people, right? And so it actually has a racial construction. And so what you'll do is you'll teach your families where the kinds of race that, that are appropriate, right? And so I think it is a risk factor. In fact, I often have to tell my students that I had to tell them this on Wednesday, uh, Thursday. If you feel unsafe, lock your doors. Right? Don't don't tell don't tell anyone that they told I told you to leave your doors unlocked. But what I do want you to do is when you lock the door, ask yourself why you do it. Right? What was it that triggered the lock? What was it that triggered you not going through a certain hollow? Right? What what and and they can all be risk factors. Right? Shotgun Right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. 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 Vacation when he's driving through Chicago and I'm still in the subcab. Right. <laughs> no, that's right. That that's right. Yeah. You know, in, to, to me, I was talking to a, a friend of mine about this uh, uh, a while back. It's like, well, when, when you look at movies, the black and white movies, I mean, the, the, there's movies that, that just depict uh, depict us in a way that's just weird, you know, like Soul Plane, and, you know, we're, we're sitting there, and we got forties, and, 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 and we're smoking and all that stuff, and, you know, and, and, or we got a gun in our hand, and, and we're we're so, you know, and, and our, our, our our clothes are hanging down to our, our behinds, and, oh, and, and it's the same way in music videos and stuff like that. And I said, you know, if we said, if we as a, 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 a race said, you know what, we're not doing that anymore. From here on out, we're always yes, going to uh, do movies. You've had musicians make their entire career off of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, but now the, the kids want to be like that. They don't know that these people are just playing a role. These people are uh, collecting $100,000. Black dollars in one check. You know, yeah, Latin dollars in one check. Yeah, Latin dollars in one check. Yeah, Latin all the way to the bank while everybody is trying to pretend like they're hard and stuff. Maybe if you didn't have that, you know, maybe then we could actually get out of that stereotype. I don't want to see someone that's well, you know, with walking down the street with their with their. Uh, it's, 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 it's like there's different freedom. kinds. There's different kinds of black people. You know, you got that group of black people that act like that. And I'm and honestly, where I live, I don't see really much of that at all. And I'm not saying that to be like, ooh, or, or I'm just the upper cross black people. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm saying about not all black people do that. But it seems like the black people, they get the <laughs> attention 
are the ones who do that. Mm -hmm. Like the, the people that are educated, that go to work every day, it's like, we don't get any attention. So, uh, so yeah. you know, we really don't get attention uh, on the news. You don't see them applauding a black person who has got a degree and going to work every day and keeping their lawn cut and obeying the law. What do you see on the news? Well, the black person, so the, the person who broke the law. You don't right. see the good. Right. So when people look at TV, they're like, their mind is, oh, they like this, like that. It, the good doesn't get praised. And, and the I media can tell you does that poorly. That? The media in general, if you think about it, what, what sells? It's not a happy story. It's not a happy ending. It's a bad story. It's a right. Yeah, I can tell you for a fact. That's all we think about it. Please, yeah. please. Exactly. You know? And go ahead. How many people in this room have a 70 year old kid? How many people? From Scarlet. Or had one of them? 70 year old. 70 17. You have a six year old Yeah, okay. So, because if you notice, talking about media, I'm glad you opened that up. Mm -hmm. Whom do you see being praised on the media? Is it the black successful kid? Who gets what invited anywhere? Right? In the White House or whatever. When, when our president stands up and speaks, who is he defending? Is it my son? No. Is it your son? No. And this is something we have to speak of against because we are stereotyped because we let it happen. Mm -hmm. Why can't successful black kids be praised every day on TV? Mm -hmm. No. We come out of the woodwork and we march and trample and this and that when a black kid has gotten in trouble. Do you see white people coming out and traveling when white kids get in trouble? No. In fact, when Jamaicans get in trouble, I don't want anyone to know that. <laughs> when they're successful, I say, yay! Yeah. Right? I'm not going to. Go down the market, so I did the wrong thing, you know? I, I think it, I think the the way uh, the, the question I mean I, I it'd be interesting to turn this around on you since you're the media representative here. But but I, but I, 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 I when I talk about racial construction with students, one of the, the one of the other ways that we talk about it is um, what does it mean to act white? And 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 black students know immediately what that means, and they're very, they don't want to talk about it. Because almost all of them at Mercer have been accused of acting white. And, and, and so I said, well, what does that mean to act black? Right. So it, get, it actually gets to your point about the way in which we are raising children to think about black and white in positive and negative ways, in, in such, so much so that they become uncomfortable. And this uh, high achieving black students have a hard time mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to be. But this is but this is why that heritage thing matters, right? <coughs> so I want to be true to my identity. But what is my identity? What what does that mean? All right? It it means I'm educated. It means that I come from a family that's a de de dedicated workers, right? All of these. Well, yes, except that somebody tells me no, that's acting white. Well, what, that's a, largely an internal group dynamic, right? I mean, white folks don't walk around telling black folks, you act white. They, act, they do it in, in a bad way, which is, he's articulate. It's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad in the sense that it's racially constructed, because I assume that so. black folks don't mm -hmm. speak properly. So. No, I understand, but... So. But, but but when I say it when I say it in a derogatory way, yeah. right? That's yeah. what it, that it's it's meant in a derogatory way. You know, it's fascinating to know what was going on here. I'm here to try to tell you that I should be insulted if somebody said I'm not here. I'm very smart. So if somebody said I'm not here, I said thank you. That's right. That, absolutely. What, what kind of idiot would I be to think of it as I'm not here? Uh, it, it, you would not be an idiot. I have been with family members who use it in a derogatory way. And so? And I called them out. You didn't have to call them out. I think I did. Well, I, think I, I feel like this is a very good point, but I also feel like we have sort of veered far away from yes. from what the play itself is. That's a lovely question to consider. I'm not sure that it was one that the playwright actually Is there any other questions? Yeah, the speaking of the playwright, I'm puzzled about how much play Kenneth and his misdeeds and his subsequent suicide got in a play that was about racism. 
Or uh, is this back to the marginalization issue? Well, I raise it with Jim. I, 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 I think the fact that it's written in 2008, 2009, that, that the, the war commentary mm -hmm. is, yeah. is actually pretty interesting. But it, I, I but, but it falls, that. but it falls down underneath of the rest of the stuff that's going on. I, mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, on that. I think because we we touched on it earlier, how it's it's above race. It's every aspect, every class of person being more than one. People based on their nationality. They talk about traveling like it's this quaint thing. The country of Zurich can do right. it in a day. But <laughs> <laughs> that's problem. I'm sorry, that's problem. <laughs> but with regard to Kenneth, uh, he's another example of that. Like they referenced the wheel boy, and he is mentally handicapped in his way. Kenneth presumably has PTSD or some sort of mental trauma, so he has a mental illness, and he's just being marginalized, just like the rest of them. But you know, even more than that, I th I think what the, the playwright is doing is he, he ends up reinforcing the personal tragedy of this family, and I think we're focused on the wrong things. And everybody has tragedies. But it's what we need to do is connect with one another because of their personal tragedies. What can I help? What can I do for you? And it doesn't matter what the color is of people. What matters is this person's in pain. We need to help them. And I, and I really believe that, that that's why he sort of framed this whole issue of race is, and, as one is. And, and I know it's, it's significant to a lot of people. But when you really get down to it, our humanity is based on how do I help this person in pain? And if we can get to that place, if we can really feel the other person's pain, then I don't think skin really color is going to have an issue. If it's not, it won't be an issue. I, I, I don't care. If I know somebody's in pain and I want, I want to help them, I, you know, you can be whatever you want. It's just something that... Uh, I want to, I want to be human, and, and I think that's where we become human is in, in how we share that human experience, the deep tragedies that we each, every one of us, uh, can can pull up. So I think that's a really important observation because it connects to what's in that box. I don't, in terms of the construct of the play, it's not an accident that that trunk ends up downstage center at the end of the play. And that we go back to a morning two and a half years before the beginning of Act One. And we go back to that morning, we go back to it. The playwright, that's not an accident, and it's not peripheral. I think the playwright is talking to us about how we deal with our personal pain, our collective pain, our um, our grief, our grieving over those pains, those community pains, those racial pains, um, whatever that pain is, and how, no matter how we can try and bury the past, unless we deal with it, we're doomed to dig it up again, and relive it again, and again, and again, unless we're able to open that box and take out what's inside it, and not just talk to one another, but to listen to one another without becoming reactive to something that's not being said. Uh, and, and ultimately dealing with, empathizing with, connecting with the pain of the other. Because that box belongs to all of us, belongs to everybody. Right. So for me, as a director and someone who Thinks about this play. It's just not an accident that that ends up right there. It's just not. Well, and that it comes from the periphery on the stage, right? Yes. It comes from the back. Yes. And then it goes out and gets buried and yeah. brought back out. And it, it's Russ that's reading it at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Russ is Dan. Yeah. Right. The, yeah, the, yeah. Which is also the, the character now is now getting to read. Right. It's the wrong character, but it's the right person yeah. getting to read. Uh, this thing. In yeah. fact, I said to Jim that um, the other night when I was here for rehearsal, to have Kenneth come in as not one of the characters you've already seen is is sort of stunning. Uh, <laughs> like, whoa, this 
this one's new. And it, it calls for it calls for me for to actually him to do that dead. part. And I but, thought it was inspired but, yeah. to have somebody so much more to really punch it home. Kenneth, who's been hovering over both acts. Mm. Oh my God, it's Kenneth. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Yeah, I I agree with both of you. I my my sense of my sensitivity to it is that we can be hopeful to get to that point. Yes. I, I, we, we, we bring a lot of baggage with us. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. We, we aren't free to always do it all on our own. Yeah. Uh, and that's the part that the play catches for me, is how these things are constructed around us and, and we have to deal with them, um, whether we want to or not. Well, my folks were here today and they'll both be 82 this year. And they lived in the hills of Kentucky. The town my mother was born in is so small that it's not on all the maps. <laughs> and she's got it's salt and pepper now, but she had black, black hair, and she would get a tan putting the Christmas tree lights on. And there were stores <laughs> in Cincinnati, Ohio that would not serve her when she was a little girl in the summertime <laughs> because they thought she was black. And you know, that that did a lot to her to make her go, whoa, I know how that, meant. she had a taste, the most minor taste of that. But I've seen my parents go from, my mother one time talked to her about jobs that were not, that there were male jobs and female jobs. And how she's grown past that. And uh, my folks being very, very skittish about um, many different types of people to where now they've grown and changed so much with what they've seen and experienced in their lifetime. Having them come here today, I was mostly worried because I'm playing a mother who's lost a child and my parents have lost a child. And I was worried about their response to the show because of that. So I had to prepare them, but they, they've come a long way and seen a lot and uh, they really enjoyed the show and I think they appreciated it for for what it was and I don't know that they could have without like I said, hillbillies, long line hillbillies and which is equally pejorative like redneck which is a different part of the country and I remember my mom telling me when she was, you know, they were about going in Cincinnati and they said nobody was ever ugly but it was just no, no sweet. And uh, that, that made more work on her. Dear, so. I think Pam speaks, like my, I had to prepare my parents well. One of the things, you know, I don't tell them a lot about what I'm doing because I want them to enjoy the show and go in it. But I did tell them, I was like, you know, there's a son that he dies, you know, he kills himself. And they lost a child as well. And it's like, I just wanted to let you guys know that. So, and it was so funny, and my mom told me, she was just like, you know, there's a house, there's racial divides, oh, the black man wants to have been, oh, not the white man wants to it's just like, I love how out of that whole thing, a person committed suicide after being in a war, and it got like maybe five, ten minutes of attention yeah. tops, because we were so focused on everything else. It's gotten to the point where she's like, I feel like everything, she was like, I think the play, what it, she said, what it told me the most, she's like, I don't know what I was trying to, was that we have forgotten what's important in life, mm -hmm. which is life itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, you know, uh, on my off time, sometimes during work, you know, uh, and they always, uh, a lot of them are inspirational, some comedy or whatnot, but a lot of them, a lot of times I hear the same phrase, and, and, and it's, you know, we have, we have first world problems. Yeah. You know, when you think about, when you think about all of the stuff that's going on overseas, you know, the people who are so are dying because they don't have enough food, people who water in a clean water, you know, the people who are ex uh, contracting all of these diseases of Ola and whatnot that mm -hmm. nobody can really do much about. Right. And to sit here and think, oh, well, I don't like this person because he looks different or he acts a certain way or what have you. For that to be your problem, for that to be the, the, uh, your main focus of conflict when there's so much more important stuff going out there, that's, that's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming today, and I want to thank Doug a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was lovely of you all to stay.
day and participate in it, so I appreciate it. Thank you all. So, great job.